On tonight's show, we host the music historian for the National Association of Music Merchants, who has the industry's oral history program. We have another great show lined up for you tonight, so don't go anywhere, stay right where you are. We'll be right back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Robert D'Alessio, and we are broadcasting live from Montreal, Canada. I'm the host of Rob's Inner Circle. Thank you for tuning in to what is going to be an absolutely exciting show. I want to give out the usual shout out to the amazing producer of Rob's Inner Circle, Jenny Duhame. And to the podcast, thank you on our show, Patty, Lady Starlight, Sarah Gosa. Thank you so much, girls, for being there and for making this show as great as it is. A couple of announcements for you folks tonight. The Noon Hour Out of the Box podcast, I so proudly host with the amazing Esther Brzezinski that is every Wednesday at the at noon, that is, Wednesday at noon, from noon uh, to 12.15. Uh, is is going to be on the uh, Access Radio Internet service, and you can catch us every Saturdays between noon and three o'clock, and you can catch us live Wednesdays between noon and twelve fifteen. This week, this Wednesday, we're going to be having an amazing guest. We'll be discussing lucid dreaming with our special guest on the show. He's the the expert on lucid dreaming. His name is Ian Tranzi. Last week, we forgot to mention all of the amazing efforts for the Movember. That's right. We wanted to mention last week that we brought in $541, and that's all thanks to your amazing contributions. So whether you walked with Captain Mojen or donated for the Polar Bear Dunk Challenge, this is all thanks to Tim Steinrup, or you were just supporting us with your positive energy, we at Bobby Short Shorts and Big Records, thank you so much for all of your support. You can still donate. You, still, you can still give contributions by going on to the link that is on to the bottom of your screen right now. The Daily Struggles sitcom is up and running on the Rise Up TV channel on the Roku streaming service. And if you don't have a Roku streaming stick, very easy to get. All you have to do is go into Amazon.ca or Amazon.com, and you can get one for as little as $30. All of the Rob's Inner Circle merchandise is readily available at 514brandingco.com. You can get some of our amazing T-shirts on there, some coffee mugs, comforters, pillows, you name it, we got it all. That's all of Rob's Inner Circle merchandise at 514brandingco.com. Com. We encourage you to go onto the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel and to watch all of our amazing productions on our playlists. You want to go on there, you want to click the like button, leave us some nice comments, subscribe to the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel, and you want to hit that notification bell because every time we have a new production, you will be the first to know all about them. Well, folks, it's that time once again. It's that time to slip into our weekly ritual. That's when we get to sit back, relax, take a deep breath. <sighs> Exhale, let out the bad air. Enjoy the show. Kick up your feet on the edge of the table and join us for an amazing show. Folks, it's showtime. Let's get it on. It is time to bring on our amazing guest. Tonight's star attraction is coming to you live from the NAM studio in Carlsbad, California. That's 35 miles just south, actually not south, north of San Diego. Here he is from sunny state, California, our guest tonight, Mr. Dan Del Fiorentino. <laughs> Boy, I feel welcome. This is fantastic. Rob, 
What an honor it is to hang out with you and your amazing staff. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for being here, Dan. And you are one of our quality guests, actually. If you want to know a secret, each and every one of our guests is a quality guest <laughs> on our show. And you're no exception, Dan. Well, it might be you're reaching a little far in the barrel to get me, but that's okay. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, hopefully we'll have some fun. We will have some fun. And Dad, to open up the show, talking about having some fun, you have some kind of an anecdote because you know all about um, something about the origins of the real Silver Bells version. So maybe you want to share that with us. Oh, yeah. This is a great way to start the holiday podcast off is uh, the original lyrics for Silver Bells, that great holiday classic. You know, back um, in the early part of my career as an oral historian, I got to interview the two songwriters, Ray Evans and Jay Livingston. They were under contract for the movie studios in Los Angeles, and they would go from studio to studio and uh, be hired for movies, and they would sit around and the script would come hey, give us a song about railroads. Okay, and they write a song about it. Oh, give us a song about this, give us a song about that. And they were very good at it. In fact, they won four Oscars for their music, one of which was a song uh, for a, a, a movie that Judy Garland was in in the late 40s called Meet Me in St. Louis. And the, uh, the script called for a Christmas song. So the two of them in the middle of the spring were banging each other's heads trying to figure out, okay, I, we don't feel like we're in the Christmas spirit, but let's write a Christmas song. Um, so they wrote this song. They were pretty pleased with it. Uh, Jay Livingston uh, tells the story about going home to his wife, lying on the couch. Hey, honey, we had a really hard day. Can you hand me my drink? Uh, boy, it was tough, you know, when they tell you you have to write a song, it's a lot harder than it being inspired by something. But I think we came up with a good one. Um, so we're going to have it recorded tomorrow. And she goes, well, that sounds great, honey. Um, <laughs> what's the name of the song? And he said, it's Tinkle Bells. And she said, what? You know, like the tinkling of the bells. And she had to say, Jay, when women go to the bathroom, they usually use that term. So I don't think it should be the name of the uh, Christmas <laughs> classic. So <laughs> I love that story because I just ruined it for everybody listening. But every time you hear that song now, the only thing they changed was the word tinkle to silver. The rest <laughs> of the song is exactly the same. <laughs> well, I, I just thought I'd let you know that you are hugely responsible for the fact that that song is stuck in my head and it's going Sorry. to go way into the new year, Dan. And now there's no way you're getting that song out of my head unless you come up with something else. Okay, I, I got one other one. You know, <laughs> go the, ahead. You know, the original lyrics for Mona Lisa was, is actually Prima Donna. They changed a little bit of the lyrics on that when they changed the title, but uh, Prima Donna was the original lyrics of that song. Those guys were amazing. They also wrote um, Que Sera Sera, which you probably know from the Doris Day movie, and then they got into television later on and also uh, wrote the theme song to one of my wife's favorite uh, uh, TV shows growing up, Mr. Ed, The Talking Horse. So <laughs> they had a prolific career for sure. <laughs> so Dan, you've been around at NAM since 1998, and you've conducted no fewer than 4,800 interviews. I mean, that's pretty amazing. You must have some beautiful memories of some of the best interviews ever that you've had, either with merchants or artists. Can you tell, share, share with us what some of those most amazing interviews that you conducted? Well, that's a really big question, and I really appreciate the opportunity because I feel really honored to have this position. You know, I get to hang out with all my heroes, all these amazing people, many of which become my friends, and I'm very, very proud about that fact. Um, it's been a whirlwind. You know, my first interview I conducted uh, when my voice was changing for a radio show I had as a teenager. I thought, oh, they're not going to want to hear this squeaky voice they're going to want to hear something interesting. So I came up with the idea of interviewing musicians of the records I was playing and then having them tell their stories. So that was a wonderful introduction to this career of mine because those guys, see, the show I had was playing jazz and big band music, and this is in the early 80s. So a lot of the original guys were still alive 
uh, but they weren't working. So once I got a hold of a musician's union book, I called them up and they were all so pleased to talk to me about their career. Uh, Cab Calloway, Lena Horne, Lionel Hampton, some of these names might be familiar, uh, sort of stars of the big band era. And they were all so so nice to me. I mean, they they answered all my dumb questions. Um, <laughs> one of which was the, the great Cab Calloway. Those of you who may know that the movie The Blues Brothers, he played Minnie the Moocher in that in that movie, um, and of course had a bunch a bunch of hits for a long long career that that guy had. Uh, one of which was this song that I didn't know anything about. So I, I sort of naively asked him. I said, "So uh, Cab." tell us the story about Minnie the Moocher. And he kind of smirked a little bit and said, uh, okay, well, I'll give you the true story, but first, how old are you, kid? And I started <laughs> laughing. I said, I, <clears throat> I'm 15. And he, said, he says, because that determines what story I tell you. Either she was a prostitute or she was a very nice lady that lived around the corner. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. You have so many nice stories to tell us, but let's find out a little bit about you. Let's find out who you are exactly. Tell us uh, where you were born and as you were growing up, what your aspirations were coming into the world. Wow, okay. Uh, well, I was born in Bloomington, Minnesota, which is just south of the Twin Cities. Um, I, I always joke that my brother and I used to play stickball in the parking lot of what is now the parking lot of Mall of America. Um, it was a nice childhood. Um, my mother plays the piano and organ in what I call every wake and wedding. We were always at church. And as a kid, I remember being underneath the piano and the organ and playing with the foot pedals and all of that, kind of being bored sometimes, but really observing that music. And it, uh, it, it, it just, it took, you know, I just, I fell in love with melody and lyrics and, um, any chance I could, I would just be exposed to, to music. Uh, when I was a little older, my grandfather gave me a transistor that I wasn't allowed to have on after nine o'clock. But of course, that's the whole point of having a transistor. It fits perfectly under your pillow. And I would listen to all these stations all the time and got exposed to all this great music. Um, but I think it what really sealed the deal to me is meeting some of the musicians, meeting some of the players, the songwriters, the producers, uh, and then later on here at NAMM, some of the merchants, the people who own the music stores that sell those products, some of the people who come up with the ideas of these instruments, some of the luthiers uh, like um, Fender and, and, and Les Paul and people who came up with the idea of these musical products. Uh, that really sealed the deal to me because the passion that folks have for music, as you guys all well know, is pretty deep. Okay. Uh, it's really, really amazing. And that's the one thing that we all have in common, no matter who your competitor is, no matter where you are in your life. If you have the challenge to bring music into the home of a young child or somebody to get back into music after playing many years, that's the goal. And that's what we all thrive for. So I, I found that commonality everywhere I went, and that was a driving force for me, for sure. Well, uh, as you can see, um, we have uh, Dan's name uh, with his wife's name, Suzanne. She will be joining us a little bit later during the show, and she's an amazing person and completes Dan so <laughs> well. They're such an amazing couple. They work well together, and we'll have uh, Suzanne come on, and she'll be able to share some of her anecdotes with us as well she's got many to share. In the meantime, Mr. Dan Del Fiorentino, to thank you for coming on to our show, we've got to have our toast. Oh, ho, okay. And what's that you're drinking, Dan? Um, well, it's clear. It's beef eater gin, isn't it? Yeah. I can smell it from here. <laughs> well, you know what? Let's plug, let's plug our source right over here. You couldn't have it any other way. Captain <laughs> Morgan Spice Rum. And actually... This is my first sip, okay? So don't worry, okay. folks. I haven't had any before. Cheers to you, Dad. Cheers. And to Suzanne and to all a success. Cheers. Suzanne, cheers to you as well. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. It just pops up. You're off screen <laughs> cheers. I love it. So, Dan, tell us at age 14, you got yourself your first job at your sister's high school at the radio station. It was awesome. It was a great experience. Um, you know, Rob, I think about 
that first interview a lot because, of course, that was a changing point. You know, I didn't really, you asked about my direction. I didn't really have a direction at 14 years old. I, I knew I wanted to do something in music, uh, but I had no idea. I, I remember in um, elementary school, I wrote some stories. All the stories I wrote were about music and musicians. Um, so I knew there may be something in there, but I didn't know what. But that night in July 1984, um, in the, um, the green room of this jazz concert that was going on, I got to meet Trummy Young. Trummy Young was the trombone player for Louis Armstrong for many years. Uh, he was also with the Jimmy Lunsford band before that. Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby? You might remember that from the cartoons. That was him singing that song. And he was so nice, Rob. I can't, I can't even tell you. I mean, this elderly guy who had a whole big career is sitting and talking to this pimpled face kid that didn't know what end of the microphone to put up. Um, but he was just so nice. And and I listen to that interview sometimes because he gently guides me. You know, I, I might say something like, Oh, you work with Billy Holiday. She was a blues singer. And he'd say, well, you know, that's a misconception. You know, she sang the blues, but she sang everything. She was a popular singer. If you gave her a pop song of the day, she would make it her own. You know, that was, I learned something. You know, it was a constant learning lesson for me. And then I go home and listen to Billie Holiday in a different way I ever heard her before because of that knowledge. So those are the kind of things that really inspired me to keep going was the niceness of all the people that I talked to. At age 15, you got a little lucky. You got your hands on the directory of all these amazing musicians, and you got that somewhere from New York, right? Yeah, I got the local uh, chapter in New York, which, of course, is where all those old jazz guys were. Uh, I don't think they should have given me that directory, to be honest with you. I don't <laughs> think you can get it now. But I wrote a nice letter, and a lady secretary, I remember her name was Rosie. Rosie sent me a letter back and said, um, if you're using this for your radio show to promote these musicians, then we would be happy to have you uh, give you a copy. Because I think I asked in my letter, how much would it cost? And they just gave me one for free. And immediately I opened it up and it became like a Bible to me. I was just like, OK, um, who are all these different people? Um, Jonah Jones, for example, was one name that was in there. And I immediately called him. And over the years, Rob, I must have about eight hours of interviews with uh, Jonah Jones because even in his 90s, he didn't go to bed until three in the morning because oh that God. was what he was used to. So that's New York time. So in California, I go, I come home from work or after a day at school and college, I'd call him and record the conversation and just chat about everything. And he was amazing. He played with the Cab Calloway band for quite some time. And he also um, had a string of hit records in the 50s. In fact, if you look at the um, progression of the very first Grammy Awards in 1958, um, the very first award given out that evening was for a jazz album. And Jonah Jones won for a little dated of a song now, but it's called I Dig Chicks. And um, so I'm really proud that I got to know him. He had a lot of fascinating stories um, about his career. And like I say, he took the time to educate me, which I greatly appreciated. And as time went on, I guess it got a little bit easier for you to get interviews because you know what it is, it's word of mouth, right? Yeah, I got this kid, he's got all those freckles, he's got this pimples, hey, <laughs> you might want to be interviewed by him. So by word of mouth, which artists did you actually end up meeting because one of the artists you interviewed introduced oh. it to him and that like really said, wow, are you kidding? A, a lot, actually. A lot, really? Yeah. yeah. I think the number one guy on that was another uh, musician with the Cab Calloway band. His name was Milt Hinton. And Milt played the upright bass and for many, many years there. And then he got into the studios and can be heard on hundreds of records from everybody from Johnny Mathis to the Supremes. He was in the background just playing that bass. Uh, he also lived into his 90s and he was just so kind. He was so gentle. I would call him and he'd say, is this my friend, Dan? You know, it was just so great to, to know him. Uh, and he would say, well, you know what? I think you ought to call this guy up. And he'd give me numbers that weren't in the directory. Um, and um, some of those um, 
include, well, I was really happy about, uh, he introduced me to Lionel Hampton, uh, the great vibraphonist. In fact, uh, considered to be the very first guy to play jazz vibraphone on a recording. Um, he worked with Benny Goodman and helped break the color barrier line there in, in records with uh, white musicians playing with African Americans. Uh, and he went on to a huge career with his theme song, Flying Home. And Hamp was fantastic. In fact, a funny little anecdote about Lionel Hampton is after a while of me calling him, he started calling me Gates. And I thought, how cool am I? I've got this jazz nickname. This is so cool. He knows me as Gates. <laughs> and I met him in person once. There was a whole room of people there. And I realized he calls everybody Gates. He can't remember anybody's name. <laughs> so he, everybody is Gates. But, you know, you don't care. You know, you're being called Gates by Lionel Hampton. It's not bad. <laughs> well, well, one of our uh, audience members, Peter Tam, uh, put up a comment. Uh, Patty, can you put that back up for us? Uh, he wanted to know a little bit more about Jonah Jones. Oh. He's somewhere in the archives over here. Well, uh, okay. there you go. He would love to hear about Jonah Jones. Can you elaborate a little bit about Jonah Jones? For he was very, our... very happy. Born in Kansas City, this guy had an amazing flair for the trumpet. His hero was Louis Armstrong. And in fact, he met Louis a couple of times, and Louis gave him a mouthpiece for which I proudly have. Um, he was just an amazing guy. He really depicted the early, early days of jazz. If you're interested in some of those really sort of pre-swing jazz recordings in New York, I'm talking about like the Cotton Club years, you know, way back in the early uh, 30s, late 20s, he recorded with a violinist named Stuff Smith. And they had a series of records, one of called one of which was called Wolf, um, and the other one was Eyes of Muggin. And those songs were great influence on a whole generation of people. I have a funny anecdote uh, since you're uh, since Peter is asking. Um, Peter, my favorite Jonah Jones uh, story. I have a lot, but my favorite is when he was a young kid. He heard Louis Armstrong and was determined to learn how to play his trumpet, which he got at a community band. Their parent, his parents couldn't afford to have one, but the community band provided him one as long as he would take lessons and play in that band. And so he had a trumpet, but he really wanted to play this jazz stuff instead of this orchestration uh, classical music that was being taught to him. So he saved up. He, I mean, he literally did every little thing you can think of for a penny, you know, taking someone's groceries home, uh, this kind of thing. And he saved up. And back then, 75 cents, you could get a, 40, uh, a 78 record. And so he purchased one of West End Blues by Louis Armstrong. And um, if you look, if you listen to that, Louis got this amazing, he's doing circular breathing in the beginning of that song and has this long intro. And so Jonah was fascinated by this, but knew that he could not play that music while living with his grandmother in his grandmother's home. So he would look out the front door and out the window and watch her go away, going on errands, going to the grocery store. And then he would put on the Louis Armstrong record. He said he'd take off the Paul Robinson album <laughs> and put on the Louis Armstrong record. And then he'd pick up the needle. You know, a couple of notes would go by really fast. Jonah's like, okay, let me hear that again. he pick it up, pick it up. He got so engrossed into this that he did not realize his grandmother had come home. Now, I heard two different versions of this. My favorite version is when grandma actually kicks the door in. I don't know if that really happened, but she came bursting into the room one way or another and said, Jonah, don't you dare play that music of prostitution in my home. Oh. She says, I was 11 years old. I didn't know what prostitution was. <laughs> well, it was probably a forecast of things to come. Who knows? Great guy. What a charming guy. I'm so blessed. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for asking me to talk about Jonah. I absolutely love him. I, my second son uh, is named after him, as a matter of fact, Jonah Del Fiorentino. So near and dear to me. Thank you for that. Well, you see, Peter Tam is a, an amazing uh, jazz artist. He's from Vancouver, Canada, British Columbia. So, you know, just throwing it out there, maybe he <laughs> might be an interest to you that you know, might want to interview him. For one of your NAM shows. Sounds great to me. Who knows? <laughs> so then I, I uh, let's go on. Let's move along here with the uh, the podcast. I wanted um, 
I was thinking this over and go, with the advent of internet, has that in some way hindered the development or the advancement, you know, of things the way they were going on before with radio and other sources? Has internet well, actually been like a bother? Has it like gotten in, in the way? You know, the first thing that comes to mind when I think about that question, Rob, is the fact that before the internet, many people were never interviewed. Many people's stories were not documented. And it was a little bit harder back then for me to interview people because they didn't really know what it was about. Um, you know, some of the more popular people that we've been talking about, the Cab Calloways, you know, of course, they're, be, they're used to being interviewed for all kinds of media. Um, but the folks that I was also interest, interested in interviewing in the early days of my NAM career were people like music merchants, uh, um, engineers of musical products, luthiers of guitars and other instruments, and they weren't so much used to it. Um, so it was a little bit difficult for us to explain what it was about, what we're going to do with it, and that kind of thing. Now, just about everybody has access to a phone that will be able to record an interview with your grandparents or whoever. Uh, so the concept isn't as foreign as it used to be. So that's the biggest change, I think. And while I'm talking about this, I'm just going to put a plug out there. Um, if there's somebody that's near and dear to you, I say interview them. You'll have that and you'll always have that. That's a blessing that I go back to time and time again, that I've been able to interview some of my heroes. Um, but they were also my friends. And so if I want to hear what Trummy Young sounds like, I can do that because I have a recording of it. So think about that and the loved ones and, and your favorite neighbor and your favorite uncle. There's people who are influence all of our listeners out there today. And I just encourage you, even on your iPhone, you could easily do that. Um, and I think that you'll thank yourself for doing that in the years to come. Well, that's great advice. And thank you for sharing that with us, Dan. Absolutely. So uh, you and Zach Phillips have a relationship that you've built up. As a matter of fact, Zach Phillips, who was on our show a while back, is in episode 66. And you can go into the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel and go into the playlist, Rob's in a Circle, click episode 66, you can watch the show with him. You have a nice relationship with Zach Phillips. How far back do you and Zach go? Well, I think I first met Zach, gosh, I'll have to remember, that's... Uh, maybe 2008, uh, maybe a little bit before that. And he started working here at NAMM after that. He used to be the editor of one of our trade magazines, Music Inc., um, out of Chicago. Um, and back then, I would run into him at various trade shows or other music conventions. And always, this guy gave me an insight. Hey, you know what? I, we just did an article about this guy. You really ought to do an interview with him. And one of the things that Zach and I have collaborated with over the years, I help him, he helps me, is including more and more women into our collection. Um, you know, in the early days, the mom and pop stores, you know, there's lots of women involved with the music going way, way back. Not only musicians and songwriters, there's plenty of them, engineers in more recent years, but store owners, you know, you say mom and pop for a good reason. The, the wife and the husband run the store. But you know what I found, Rob, in the early days of doing this, especially those folks that were uh, in business before and after World War II, the women really didn't want to talk about their business. You know, they just thought, oh, all I do is the books. You know, all I do is run the business. Uh, talk to my husband about that. So it was really hard for me to get my goal of at least 15% um, of our collection to be uh, females. Um, but slowly over the years, and thanks a lot to Zach, uh, we've been able to identify more and talk with more of them and interview more of them. And I'm really happy about that because that's a real goal that's really important. And I'm so happy to see so many more women involved in the music industry on several levels, many, many different levels now, which is really, really neat to see. You started the annual tribute program at NAM. What's that all about? That's a big story. I would try to tell. I can, I can feel Suzanne rolling her eyes like, okay, what version is he going to give? Um, it's a good story. She's giving me thumbs up. Um, <laughs> But it, it can be long, so I'll give you the short version. The very <laughs> first NAM show that I attended um, was in 1998. And um, as an employee, I was walking the halls uh, before the show opened. 
uh, looking at the booths and everybody setting up and so on. And I went to this one booth and the guy had put a, a taped up a picture of somebody and he wrote a little caption underneath that picture of that person. And the person looked a little familiar to me. It turns out I did not know who he was, but I got closer. I don't have great vision. So I got really up close to read the little words underneath. And I, I paused there to read it. This gentleman in the booth thought I was pausing uh, to reflect on this gentleman whose picture was depicted there uh, who had passed away. And the man in the booth put his arm around me and he said, you know, the show isn't going to be the same without him, is it? And it really struck a chord for me. Like, you know, yeah, this is a party atmosphere. You know, it's a business atmosphere. It's fun. There's live music. But you know what? There's deep relationships in this industry. And, you know, when someone passes away, there's really no place to go. I mean, if you are, if you're a retailer um, in Canada, but you have a rep who lives in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, you may not be able to go to his funeral if he passes away, no matter how deep you had a relationship with that person. So the mourning process in the music industry is a lot different than a lot of other industries. Um, and so I just had the idea, you know what? Let's pause during the first night of the NAM show as we're getting together as an industry before the party atmosphere starts, before all the live music and all those fun activities. Let's take a few minutes to just pause and reflect on those who have passed away. And um, I'm very proud to tell you, Rob, that our CEO, Joe Lamont, has told me that that's among the most important things we do uh, for our industry is those tributes. So I appreciate you bringing that up. It's near and dear to me. Uh, sadly, every year there's a lot of folks that uh, I've known in the tribute. So uh, it's a little hard to watch, but I'm really glad that we do it. You're, um, you're an absolutely amazing and talented man. Um, you're there just about every show, at the NAM shows in uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and the one in Anaheim, California. So, can you tell us for some of the musicians who are listening out there right now, who don't necessarily know what NAM is, and maybe just give us like a, a brief description of what NAM is and what the benefits are of attending one of the shows? Okay, well, NAM stands for the National Association of Music Merchants. We're an international trade association now. We started in 1901. I was not there. Um, <laughs> but uh, it has grown into really sort of the premier trade show for musical instruments. So our members are those who have booths that display their instruments, their uh, gear, uh, cables, picks, it, sheet music, anything you can think of used by musicians to make music. Um, is there on display. And then we invite, of course, our retail membership, which are the folks that come in to buy those goods for their stores to sell to the public. And um, we uh, have sort of a circle of benefits and those trade shows generate money. And we try really hard to put that back into uh, music education, supporting music programs in the governments at, at, at many different levels. Um, and trying to make more music makers so more people will go to the stores and buy those instruments so that it can flourish to have that sort of circle of benefits back to the trade shows. So um, that's a little bit about the trade shows. Uh, yes, we have uh, two shows, one in Nashville in the summer and one in Anaheim. Our Anaheim show was of course canceled as well as the, uh, last year's NAB show in Nashville. Uh, but we're coming back strong in Anaheim, California in 2022 in June. So I'm really excited about that. It feels like we got to get the family back together again. You know, we haven't been able to because of this COVID virus, but we're all anxious about getting together. Uh, if ever you want to see um, a hug fest, it's getting musicians together and music uh, music retailers together and music industry professionals together. It is a big family and we miss being together for sure. So you have a background as a saxophone player. These days, are you still playing the saxophone? And if you do play a saxophone, can you play the Pink Panther? Oh, well, of course. That was one of the first. <laughs> in fact, when I, I, I got to meet Claus Johnson, 
uh, with Suzanne. It was at a party. He was not up for uh, doing an interview with us, unfortunately. And I do believe it's pretty well public now that he has uh, some dementia, which is very unfortunate. But I did get to hang out with him for a little bit. It was a thrill because, of course, if you're going to play the saxophone, you have to play <laughs> The Pink Panther. And for me, the other song was uh, my grandfather's favorite, who was the one who gave me my first uh, saxophone, and that is Body and Soul by Coleman Hawkins. So those are the two tunes that I, I definitely learned. So playing the saxophone looks relatively easy, but I'm sure it isn't. Uh, what is the technique behind that? Because it looks as if you need some lungs that are like really powerful to blow into that piece of brass. Well, that's a good question. I would say that uh, making music with a musical instrument definitely takes a little bit of practice. And I think, unfortunately, that scares off people. But I hope it doesn't. I hope that people will take the time to say, you know, it is very rewarding to be able to express yourself musically and to accomplish something. You know, when you're going through in the early days, I remember going through those books, right, and learning every little note and where to put your fingers and all of that. Um, and the first time that you play something very simple, like, you know, Starry, Starry Night or uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb, it's thrilling. You know, wow, I can do this. <laughs> and as you progress, it, it, there, it's empowering. It, you know, it really is neat. And to be able to then play with other musicians eventually or to play so that people can sing along at home, those are really rewarding things. And um, I really encourage people to continue because at first it is a little difficult to play an instrument. It's not easy. You have to learn about breathing. You have to learn in the case of uh, the saxophone fingering and, and where you want those notes to go. But I think it doesn't take too long for you to be satisfied because um, making music is a very rewarding thing. And I think it's very, very important. I, to me, it's a healing thing as well. I think there's a lot of healing power in, in music. There's a lot of uh, psychological uh, help. You know, you can clear your head. You, you know, you can be in a different place. Uh, I, I, it's very rewarding. I couldn't talk enough about it. Someone who has asthma, that must be absolutely fantastic for them. Well, I don't know too much about that, but I can say that uh, it definitely is healing for people. You know, I've heard that time and time again. I've interviewed people that said that, you know, car accidents, that Les Paul, you, I, you had his name up earlier. You know, he was involved in a car accident and uh, the doctor said that he would never play again. Um, but that is not the case. He went on to have a whole huge career in music. Um, uh, so determination, I think, was part of that story for sure. Uh, and it's not easy to train your hands and fingers, especially if there's an injury. But I think that many people have overcome those um, difficulties to go on to play and make music. Of all the interviews you've conducted, have any of them actually been put down in book form or in documentaries? Well, that's a good question, Rob. Look at you. Um, I, I, like to say that I collect the source material. That's my job. I, I'm not a writer. Uh, maybe one day, uh, Susanna, let me write a book in my retirement. Uh, but right now, um, we're too busy. And I, it's not as rewarding. I, I have a blog. I, I write some things on occasion. Um, I've been asked to write uh, articles and obituaries and things. And, and that's okay with me. But to, to really sink my teeth into writing uh, is really not my gig. I, I love being the guy who does the source material. And as a result, we have in this room alone, I can see probably maybe two or 300 books that have quoted wow. one of my interviews or maybe multiple interviews. I'm very proud about that. There have been some documentaries. There's been some uh, small, you know, what do they call those independent films that have used some of the interviews. Um, I love that, you know, and I, I think we're in a really great position at NAM, where NAM uh, does spend the resources and the and the uh, the cost to capture these interviews. But we're not looking for a profit, you know. We're putting them out there for people to learn from, and I, I really, really appreciate that. I think that's a, an amazing gift that NAM gives. Uh, because these interviews are free for people to learn from. And if you quote from them, hopefully you send me a copy of the book so I can uh, put it on my shelf. Um, it's really rewarding. I, I appreciate you bringing that up because it, there's nothing cooler than to see somebody uh, being remembered uh, who maybe have passed away 
in the book form or uh, on the internet, uh, thanks to a small interview that I did. I don't recall if it's your youngest or your oldest son. At one time, he was very young, and I believe he was in preschool. He was saying before we came on the show, and his teacher asked him, what does your father do for a living? And he gave one of the cutest answers you can possibly imagine. What is it that he said? He answered his teacher. That's the same twin that I was talking about earlier, Jonah. Yeah, he was in preschool, and he was asked, what does your dad do for a living? And Jonah said, my dad makes a friend every week. <laughs> wow, that's a beautiful way to earn a living. Not only that, but it's so true, and it's my <laughs> personality, right? I love meeting new people. I love collecting new friends. I love connecting with people. And so, yeah, I mean, when he said that, I was just as happy as can be because he nailed it. That's exactly right. I do other stuff, but I make a friend every week. <laughs> Is Suzanne standing by because we can bring her on to the show right now? He's right here. Suzanne. There she is. Suzanne Del Fiorentino. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Cheers. Hey, cheers. Hey, uh, let's have a three way uh, toast. Is that yeah. gin you're drinking? Is that beef fever, Suzanne? Beef fever, the best. Oh, that's right, the best. Cheers to you both. Success, uh, love, health, and success with Thank Matt. You. Your interviews, what have you. Thank to you, you too, Rob. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. So, Suzanne. Yes. Apparently, Dan has this talent for making people cry, you were telling me. <laughs> so, tell us a little bit about that. So, um, I, my role is I'm behind the camera um, filming and, you know, doing the behind the scenes stuff. So, I don't know why I'm up here. But I also take notes during the interviews so we can, you know, look at back and we use them in our podcast and blogs and various things. So, during the interview, I always take notes. And I'd say at least 10% of the time, suddenly I have to write, Dan makes Jules cry. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and, you know, it usually catches them off guard. And we're not really necessarily talking about something that that's, you know, heart wrenching. But they, the way you question, you know, we don't have specific questions. And this is this question. Then you go that question and that question. You know, Dan starts off kind of general and sees where the interview leads him. And so I think so, a lot of times they end up talking about something that they weren't expecting to talk about. Hmm. And then <laughs> my grandpa giving him his first instrument, you know, when you ask, well, how did grandpa, you know, afford to do that or something like that? It really touches. I don't mean to do it, Rob. <laughs> I just want to tell you right now, I don't mean to make anybody <laughs> cry, but it does sometimes happen. And I just put that up to the fact that this is meaningful to people, you know, yeah. you know, in the music industry, NAM means something. And that's one of the reasons why very few people turn us down, because they're honored to be a part of this. And I think that honor of sitting there and listening to these questions and knowing, gosh, all they want to know is about me. This is very humbling. And, you know, it, it does bring some tears to people's eyes. And I'm always very moved by that. Uh, a couple of times it happens and I'm like, oh, no, I did not want that to happen. You know, <laughs> this guy's having a hard enough time getting through this interview. But um no, it's 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 humbling for sure. Dan, you did it again. It's a glint and a little bit. Sometimes we have to stop the camera if it's a bit much. Oh, well, we can't stop the camera now because Dan did it again. It's making me okay, cry. Okay, so no crying. Okay. Don't make me cry. Rob, we can't don't stop the cry. camera here. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne, let's get serious a little bit. Okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. This is your third career. You're saying you were involved in other careers, and then you ended up with this one. So tell us a little bit about yourself, going back to sure. originally what your career was. To, to go back um, briefly, um, I started off at San Francisco State for my first college, and I was a zoology major because I really, really love animals, and I wanted to be a zookeeper. Oh. And so after first college, I moved down to the San Diego area and found out it's not so easy to get into the San Diego Zoo. And I started working in the meantime while I was working on that goal and worked different jobs in the biotech industry, kind of biology type jobs. Uh, actually, the first one, I raised insects for three years. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and after oh, probably about 10 or 11 years in the biotech industry, I went to nursing school and ended up being, a, went right into being a psychiatric nurse. Um, 
I think just because I wasn't afraid to do it and I felt almost obligated to do it because most of the nurses during the rotations in school, they were just like terrified inside the nurses unit. And I was out <laughs> hanging out with the patients. It's like, this is great, especially after coming off, you know, med surge and critical care, these really hard rotations. So I did that for about eight years, a couple different um, jobs for that. And then I retired and I retired kind of young and I wanted to do some volunteer work. And while I was figuring out what I wanted to do, I started going with Dan for some local interviews and just, you know, not really knowing what I was doing at first, just listening to the headphones, making sure there weren't any terrible background noises going on and that I could hear them. And I started learning a little bit more and more and we realized if I got a little bit better at this and perfected this, I could travel with Dan and help him out a lot because the mm. there's a lot of gear now and it's more complicated. So I worked a little bit with um, Nam's in-house uh, video editor and a very accomplished cameraman and lighting expert, Alex Rosner, who works here with Dan. And he trained me up. And so I actually, I'm a volunteer for Dan, but I get to travel with him and I do some of the local interviews and I'm also help at the NAM shows. And so it's been a wonderful, you know, probably more volunteer hours than I was gonna intend to do, but it's wonderful, it's great. Well, and I, I, must, I must add that before Suzanne, I would set up the camera and not think about the shot, you know, what it looked like. I, I, it never really even occurred to me even after because for many years, we didn't really use the interviews. We didn't put all of them up on the website. Uh, we were just collecting them. You know, it was kind of those, this long list of people that we wanted to get before they passed away was sort of my first mission. And even after that, we got younger people. I didn't use these interviews a lot but I didn't pay attention to that. All I cared about was getting the content. And then I would come back and occasionally I would look at it and say, oh my gosh, this shot really sucks. This, you know, there's garbage in the background or, you know, <laughs> sometimes they were out of focus, you know, again with my eyes. And so it was, it was horrible. And now it's amazing that that's all Suzanne. She's very artistic. You know, she'll put a flare of different colors in the background or, you know, have a, a shadow because of a, a, a planter. She'll bring the plant over and there'll be a shadow thanks to that. Uh, really clever um, attention to detail and very personable. So she lets people at ease. You know, when I'm talking, you know, they feel comfortable with her. And it's really, it's a blessing to, uh, to be able to travel and to do so much with her. Well, speaking of blessings, you were saying before we came on live, both you and Suzanne, how blessed you feel that you actually could spend a lot of time together where, where you know, otherwise it would be apart. You're working together. You're a great team. It's terrific. You complete each other very well, and it's a lot of fun. And in the process, Suzanne, over the 700 interviews that you have filmed, yep. you've come across some pretty interesting interviews. You must have a a few anecdotes you can share with us. I, I like the interesting ones. I like the fun characters. Um, I like the little personal interactions with people that you think are, you know, celebrities, but then you have a fun little moment with them. Mm. <laughs> and so I think I'm going to get to that story a uh, second. But the first one is one of my favorite interviews is Allie Willis. And she is was a songwriter and uh, very accomplished, a long list of things. Um, probably the most poppy common thing everyone would think of is the Friends theme song. So that was kind of a big deal, but uh, she wrote September for Earth, Wind and & Fire and what's Boogie, the Wonderland. Boogie Wonderland yeah. and co-wrote um, the music and lyrics for The Color Purple. The stage but, production. But what a character she was. She let it, uh, It's amazing how many famous people let us come to their, their homes. And it was a former um, Paramount party house, a <laughs> retreat for celebrities that people could go to. So she bought this house. She painted it pink. Um, the <laughs> pool in the background was, I think, amoeba shaped. She has all kinds of bowling balls half buried in the lawn and all kinds of weird art that she herself did. And she is a collector of a lot of pop art. So there was stuff all over the house, not, not disorganized or hoarding, but just all these collections, you know, old lunch boxes. She had a booth from a diner, you know, bowls of old fashioned candy and, you know, lollipops and just a great fun, fun personality. So here's this, you know, just real fun, interesting character. And, but in the shot behind her is just a wall of gold records. Hmm. And she also had two new kittens she'd adopted. And so my my big loves are 
animals and food. So I love <laughs> pe pe meeting people's animals. So we, you know, there's lots, we took lots of pictures with her and it was just a really great time. And she throws through big parties and like did the big pot of chili and had her friends over. I think one of her best friends was Lily Tomlin. So we were supposed to be invited to her next party, but one got canceled. And then she unfortunately very suddenly passed from a cardiac arrest when we had dinner plans with her. So that's, that's the hard, hard part of this job is eventually everyone's going to pass away. And, you know, there's people we do meet a really good personal connection with. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's heartbreaking when that happens. Hey, you know, you know, it's magical this evening because you have, uh, can I say, um, put on, you know, some, some material to capture an in interview forever. And tonight we're doing it with Dan Fiorentino, the man who captures all these amazing, amazing interviews. Well, tonight you are being captured. You're <laughs> amazing. I try not to be captured. But <laughs> <laughs> so both you and Dan, uh, Suzanne, have Italian backgrounds. Mm. Uh, you don't speak much Italian, but what are the traditions from the old country that you still observe today? Um, one of my funnest things was um, watching my grandmother make um, pasta sauce, which she didn't call it. She called it cooking the gravy. And it's an all day process and there's different meats and they're simmering and, you know, beautiful meatballs. And I don't know, I just have always been fascinated that she called it gravy. <laughs> and so even like it's, you know, it's just us. So I don't usually make big pots of pasta, but I, I like that attention when I'm cooking. And there's nothing that makes me happier than having the crock pot going all day long and the different times you add the food and you know, <laughs> then the vegetables at the end that you don't want to get too soft or some pasta. And, you know, I, I think that's the Italian in my in my blood. And, you know, we're kind of a feisty people. So generally um, fun loving. But <laughs> if I think that's why I could work on the psych ward, you know, it's <laughs> I, I know if, so. if I get to a, a certain point, it's not pretty. <laughs> So don't I know some, some of my friends would come over and they would tell me, why are you guys arguing all the time? Like, We're not arguing. That's normal. We talk like that. No. Well, that, that's we, we, that we don't do. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is uh, she was a psych nurse and now I'm her patient. So oh. I'm patient of one. <laughs> and just how patient are you? She's pretty patient. I'm pretty patient most of the time because Dan has always 10 things going on. So I, I try to wrangle them a little bit. I'm trying to think of a good story to tell you. Can I tell you a, a completely unmusic related? Go on, go on. The platform is all yours, Suzanne. Okay, this is the chocolate chip cookie story. Okay, go on, so, go on. Um, so we interview all kinds of different people, you know, musicians, celebrities, mom and pop music store owners, uh, people that build instruments, um, sound engineers, uh, people that build everything, you know, certain wires and stuff like that. So the engineers can sometimes be they're, they're so out of our league, what they're thinking and brilliant and technical that sometimes the social skills aren't always there. Not all of them. I'm generalizing, so I apologize. <laughs> but we did have one interview um, and it was at his home studio in front of his computer. It was downstairs and his wife had made um, chocolate chip cookies. And so we were interviewing in front of his desk and there's this big stack of chocolate chip cookies right next to him. I think I got it in the shot. I wanted it in the shot. I don't know if they were too low or not. So, we, you know, we spent an hour with him. We set up the gear, we're talking to him, we're talking to him, the cookies are right there. We pack up and leave. And I don't know which, I don't know if we even got out of the driveway. And it was probably me that said it first, like, well, that was weird. He didn't offer us a cookie. <laughs> we didn't get one. They were right there, but, Rob. I wanted one so bad. But the best part is, I'm sure, was imagining afterwards, I'm sure his wife made them because he, people were coming. And I just love imagining her reaction when, like, why are all the cookies there? Didn't they want a cookie? Oh, I didn't offer them one. <laughs> and I just love thinking of what, what the wife said to him. <laughs> about not offering. And then I have a couple other um, little fun moments. If I can, I'd like to make the celebrities seem more human because they are, <laughs> but just some really fun little quick interactions I've had. Um, we were very fortunate to interview John Kay, the lead singer for Steppenwolf. Oh. So that's a really big deal. And again, he let us come to his home and um, 
the interview took place in his gorgeous, gorgeous studio at his house. And he was walking us out as we were leaving. And I kind of saw off to another room, this cat bed and a cat. And I probably should have asked permission, but me and animals, I just like left the gear <laughs> and I went over and I could tell when I got closer, she was kind of elderly and I got down and she didn't get up and I made friends with her and I was petting her little head. And then I looked over and here's John K watching me with this huge smile mm. on his face. Cause I'm giving his old cat some love. And, you know, just to feel just a completely normal moment and connection with him for a second was just a really, really neat experience. And we have, uh, I don't, you'd only have a few more minutes, so I just don't want to take it up with my dumb stars, Jason, Jason Mraz. Okay. Yeah. So we recently interviewed Jason Mraz right here in our office. Oh, nice. And, yeah. yeah and, um, cool guy. Rob. Very really cool, cool guy, guy. Very articulate. It was a really neat interview. He's kind of poetic the way he talks. And is the whole interview up? I don't or, think or so. Or will be. There's a clip of it. Up. Yeah. So definitely go watch the clip. And then in time, the whole interview will be up because it was amazing. Where can we watch the interview? Just uh, go to Google and type in NAM, N-A-M-M, -M, and Jason Mraz, or any of the names that we just mentioned. That's a good way to get right to their oral history page on our website. Terrific. So it was funny because I kind of thought he was going to show up with an entourage and, you know, he's all in his casual clothes and his little hat and he came by himself and had his little water bottle with him. <laughs> and we did the interview and I drink, if I'm not drinking gin, I drink water all day. I love water. So <laughs> <laughs> now you have his guessing. Is that water or is that gin? <laughs> Maybe both. <laughs> so um, I was kind of, kind of aware that he was drinking this. So when we were leaving, I said, do you want to fill your water bottle up before you leave? Because there's a lunchroom with, you know, the dispenser. And he kind of looked a little happy, like I think that I even thought to ask him that. And he said, you know, I don't know how he has a bit of a drive. So he did want to fill his water bottle up. I think just to interrupt for a second, as soon as she said that, <laughs> I swear he skipped a little bit. He was just like, oh, OK. <laughs> More water for my yeah. drive home. Like, so, it was funny. so we went in the lunchroom. And he unscrewed the lid and put it under, and I held the dispenser down. And so I was like, what's it going to take? And then together he chimed in, teamwork. So I got to sing with Jason Mraz. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. So that's just a great little moment. moments are my, are my pay, my reward for doing this. Yeah, that's absolutely. Terrific. Yeah. We, we got Tim Steiner up joy, joining us. He's the front man from the Canadian heavy metal band. He's out of Vancouver, British Columbia. And he's the front man for the mighty one. Uh, Tim was on our show as well. Thanks awesome. for joining us, Tim. We also I also noticed that uh, Norm Zimmerman, Norm Zimmerman from Steve's Music also tuned in. And we he, love you, Norm. <laughs> we love you. There You're you go. He has guy. He should be your guest one time if he hasn't oh, been. He you, is. Well, you know what? Amazing I got, guy. I got great news for you. Oh. He has been our guest. Oh, cool. <laughs> I missed that one because I did look at some of those old ones, and I'm so glad. So you know, like we know, what a prince of a guy Norm it's is. A, it's a small world. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people we know there. And, geez, we're we're really drawing to the end of the show. There's one thing I'm curious about. You know, we, from being from Montreal, it, it's snowy here. It's cold and all that. And Christmas is coming up. And we have our way of celebrating things. I'm just curious. What is Christmas like in Carlsbad uh, on a sandy beach? You can go. Uh, well, yeah, you can, you can decorate palm trees. I will confess, we're, we've been kind of simple the last few years. And at our house, there's a large succulent. It's a uh, common name is a pencil tree. And it's in the driveway. And it's this big, it's got probably four branches. And uh, we it takes five minutes to put up our Christmas decorations because we just <laughs> light up our cr Christmas cactus. <laughs> but you know, what's really neat is that um, Christmas is usually pretty warm here. Um, and not always, because there's definitely a rainy season, but it seems to me that uh, in the last several years that I can remember, Christmas day, well, it's a little chilly. Well, cold for us is not cold for you guys. So forgive her for saying that 50 degrees is cold. Um, but uh, a walk on the beach is a very common thing yeah. around here on, on Christmas, and it's really neat. Uh, I, I, last year, we saw a family making their Christmas card picture by making a sand uh, a sand uh, sculpture of a snowman, and then they put uh, baking flour 
on it to make it look look like it was white. (laughs) Sorry, can you hear us? I can hear you. What happened? There we go. We heard you now. I have to go on a sandy beach and experience Christmas in the Californian heat one day. Come on. <laughs> you have a traditional I, Christmas margarita. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what does Santa Claus look like? Is he like in running shoes or sandals, beach sandals? Oh, yeah, he's ripped. He's got abs. He's, he's ripped. We saw huh? the other day in a kayak. We saw a Santa in the kayak. Oh, yesterday. my God. That must be yeah. hilarious. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, this hour has gone by so fast. Um, On behalf of myself, Jenny and Patty and all our viewers, thank you so much for having joined us. And we've immortalized this interview, and it's all yours for keeps. You know, you can, uh, we're going to be sending it to you. Thank you so much for being part of our history on our show, Rob's Inner Circle, and uh, for being such an amazing man and doing something really, really amazing. Teamed up with your lovely wife, Suzanne. You're such a great, beautiful couple. Congratulations, and thank you for all the good work you're doing for us. It's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you to you and your amazing team. You guys made it so easy. Everybody in the background there, good job. (laughs) And, of course, that charming face of Rob makes the whole thing worth it. (laughs) You're too kind. And you want to close off the show by saying something to the audience? Yes, go. Too much pressure. Jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. Really Thank appreciate it. Pleasure. So stand by. We're going to be having our meet and greet right after the show. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. There you have it, folks. That was uh, Dan Fury, Suzanne. And what is going on here with this crazy camera angle? There you go. Finally, we figured that out. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to our exciting show. We remind you to tune in this upcoming Wednesday at noon on the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel. Yes, there's Bree's YouTube channel and on my personal Facebook page. I co-host Noon Hour in the Box with the amazing Esther Brzezinski. We're going to be hosting an amazing guest. It's all about lucid dreams. His name is Ian Schranzi. He's from foreverlucid.com. You can also hear... Um, the Noon Hour Out of the Box podcast on Access Radio every Saturday between noon and 3 p.m. That's Saturdays, noon between between noon and 3 p.m. on accessradio.ca. That's the Noon Hour Out of the Box show. Next week, we're going to be hosting another amazing guest. He's a Canadian songwriter and musician, Mr. Kylie Styles. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you next time next week. Ciao.